after Original Sin 1 released, uh, what was the next game going to be? It was question number one. And uh, it gave some breathing room for the content guys to start thinking about what are we going to make next. And so it really became an effort of looking what the community was talking about, what their problems were, how we could fix that. Clearly, there was a lot of emphasis on the, on the weak narrative of the first one. A lot of effort started on, on, on creating the story for Divinity Origins into a really a lot of effort. My name is Jan van Dosselaar. I'm the writing director um, at Larian Studios. I've been at studio for 10 years now. So I started out writing um, Divinity 2, Dragonite Saga. At that time, I was the only um, writer in the studio. So obviously, when we start working on games, I was the one writing them. That's, that's that. I didn't know anything about how a game is made and all the processes involved, but I learned a lot about design. Quest design and how to implement content, how to test it, QA it, all the systems that come along with it. And then for Original Sin, when we were, I think, one third or something, or half through the project, then another writer uh, joined us, Sarah Bayless. She's in the Dublin office. So then, finally, <laughs> you know, I had a colleague, a writing colleague, uh, and we took it from there. My name is Kevin Van Ord. I am a writer at Larian Studios, and so far, my one project has been Divinity Original Sin 2. My name is Charlie, and I'm one of the writers here at Larian. I work on core story, dialogues, anything that needs writing. For me personally, the expansion was something quite impressive, something that happened very quickly because for most of my time at Larian, I worked alone. And then when Original Sin 2 really started being developed, all of a sudden there were like eight of us, but they're wonderful people and they're a great fit. So, you know, the, the transition was, was pretty smooth actually. And it's nice to have new people on board, new voices, new inputs, have their own stamp on the game, their own creativity that they bring to the project. Yeah, we've got, all, we've got a, a lot of writers and it's, it's only grown since uh, Divinity Original Sin 2 came out. It's kind of interesting because we're split. Most of the writers are actually in, in Dublin and Jan and I are here in Ghent. But luckily we all communicate really, really well. We all have a really good idea of what the tone of the games are. I mean, I think we, we do try to have a consistent voice and we have a writing cheat sheet that basically gives us the general ideas of what the style should be like and the general guidelines. And at the same time, we, all, we also want everybody's individual personalities to shine through the writing too. But how we organize as a team, like in terms of our process, we'll all be working in the same Google document at the same time, all like writing over each other, commenting each other's stuff, um, kind of a chaotic process. It's a bit complicated at first, of course, because all of a sudden we have to work with people in St. Petersburg, we have to work with people in Quebec, and especially the, the time difference is, 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 is big. But it's much more of a blessing than a curse. You know, fresh blood, it just it, it works, it, it, brings, uh, it brings in new ideas, it brings in a lot of creativity. And when we sit around the table talking about story, it's just actually, it's, it's a fun experience to do it like that and then take it back and think about it individually, come up with new designs, come back together again. So it's a good way of working, I think. Of course, we were motivated by the fact that Original Sin 1 was um, received quite well. And then on the other hand, we knew we had um, a lot of work ahead of us because we wanted to drastically change the way dialogue works in the game. So Original Sin 1 kind of suffered from text block syndrome, which is completely different from, from the way we approached it in Original Sin 2. The writing tools for Original Sin 1 were a little more ancient. There, there was actual, you know, kind of like script language involved. There wasn't really a, a vast tool. They couldn't do the kinds of things we did in Original Sin 2. In Original Sin 2, we ended up having an entire dialogue editor created super fancy thing that only gets added to and polished over time um, that allowed us to uh, use things like the tag system and have big branching dialogues. It was almost like when you go to the store and there's a shelf full of cereal right in front of you and you're like, there's so many choices I don't know what to buy. It's like I have this dialogue editor and there's so many choices I don't even know where to begin. That, that's actually kind of a treat because then you get to start experimenting and uh, you get to sort of learn how you create gameplay out of dialogue, how you can make every dialogue have at least some kind of interesting choice. 
that allows a player to express themselves. And that's always the key for us, is we always want players to be able to express themselves and we want every choice to have at least some kind of meaning, whether that has repercussions through the game or whether that just has meaning in the moment for who you are as the character in the game or as the player. And you just notice when people play it or stream it, you can tell that they give much more attention to the dialogue as it works in Original Sin 2. And then of course there were the, the origin stories and that's the really big uh, innovative part because you had these six unique characters that not only you could add to your party and experience their story from that point of view, you could also actually play them. You could be Red Prince, you could be Sibyl, you could be Los, you know. And that was easily said. <laughs> Boy, it was not so easily done. And nobody had ever done it before, so we needed to invent it completely. And we needed to do it in multiplayer. It definitely brought along a lot of challenges, but uh, in the end I think it worked out really well and we did something very unique. If something like that happens again, you do what needs to be done. Deal? Well, all right then. She pinches your cheek, a sparkle in her dim grey eyes. I knew I could count on you to murder me in a pinch. It's a great feeling to be able to do what you want, of course. But uh, that led to quite some creative quests, it's quite some creative designs actually. One of my characters in Divinity Original Sin 2 actually was a callback to the existential skeletons, only it's a, it's a reversal of it. So you're the one that has the existential crisis and could explode. I think my favourite dialogue I wrote, like the, the most fun dialogue I wrote, was uh, the owls in arcs. These owls were, uh, one of them like has choked to death on a hand and you can like take the hand out of his mouth and talk to a spirit and you can eat the hand if you're an elf and yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound that funny now but believe me, it's very funny. <laughs> There's always been quite some, some humour. The problem was a little bit that sometimes there was, let's say, somewhat of a discrepancy between trying to tell a serious story and having NPCs that um, were maybe sometimes just a tad too absurd. We learned a lot from that and we remedied it to a great extent in, in Original Sin 2. I, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw, they were stolen, the babies, the eggs, something, something took them. You know, every time it's, you, you start from scratch again, that's it, it's like the one is over, okay, here comes the next one and you sit together and you start talking about story and you have hours and hours and hours of meetings about this. It's very difficult <laughs> to create a story that has lots of branching paths. First of all, you'll, you'll write it up in the core story document the way it's supposed to be, and it'll be a nice little high-level paragraph overview where everything just seems like, oh, this is fun, this is easy, this is quick, and then uh, we'll make a flowchart. Uh, the scriptures will make a flowchart for like how that quest will actually go, all the different permutations that will arise from it. And then when we've looked at that and said, yes, that, that makes sense, then they'll go and make that uh, into dialogue trees. A lot of the time I was just making post-it notes for myself. Like, remember that this guy needs to say something about this. Writers aren't just writers. It's not like we just get the blanks and then we fill it in, like it's some color by number painting or something like that. You know, we're designers. We start with the overall narrative and the, the, the core design. And then along with, with scripters and other people in the building, we just start working out situations. We know more or less what we want to communicate, more or less kind of what the situation is going to be. And then when it comes to the specifics, the writer and the scripter just get down to designing the parts of that. And I don't think people realize how much of the writing in the game they're not even really noticing. You know, you, you think about things like, what are items named, and what about the menus, and what about this, and what about that? A lot of thought goes into just those little things that you're typically not even noticing. There are things like item descriptions. Um, I bet you a lot of people don't even go into their inventory and, and click to see what the description on the item is, but a lot of love and thought goes into stuff like that. The writing for Divinity is, is just so good. You know, I added the little cherry on top in terms of, okay, here's the voice and here's what they're going to feel like. But they're so well written, even if they had one or two lines, every character feels alive and realistic and with their own story to tell. So it's a real kind of collaborative process of starting with the fantastic writing with the character on the page and then just sort of massaging that character into existence with what they're going to feel like and sound like. Oh.
I'm sorry, madam. I didn't mean anything by it. I'm just the handsome gardener. There's a huge variety of, of motivations and personality types and drives in the characters that are inhabiting Rivalon and it shows in the players and which characters they've gone, oh I really love that one. You get people who who are absolutely in love with Ifan and then you get somebody who thinks Sibyl's the best thing in the world or they're in love with Malady or they hate Malady but they really really like Losa and it it's so interesting to see which players bond with which characters. It's, it really is a reflection on the wide variety of people who play this game. As far as uh, the, the creation of the game world, um, Rivalon, um, as far as that is concerned, the writing team obviously has a lot of input there because we don't just write dialogue, you know, we, we design basically the, the, the entire game world. So it's not just fleshing out characters, it's also fleshing out areas. And every time we think about an area, it has to have a believable place in the game world. It has to have a believable history in the game world. And, you know, every time we come up with like cool places, situations uh, and things like that. And every time it just adds bit by bit, block by block to what Rivalon is and it will change from one game to the next as we add new areas and new places to explore and hopefully they'll want to explore it further down the line. I'm uh, Joachim. Um, I'm doing art direction on Divinity Original Sin 2. On Original Sin 1 I worked as a 3D artist slash level designer slash level artist. But now my primary focus is doing art direction. At the time when we were releasing, I think we were already working on the second one. Because art is always done sooner. I know programmers went very far in overtime and doing work, while art is usually done by the time that the game gets released. There were a couple of improvements that we really wanted to do for Original Sin 2. Not everyone really liked the cartoony look that we had to give uh, Original Sin 1. We kind of had to give it because we wanted to try out an art direction that not everyone was doing. We didn't want to do the realistic approach, we wanted to jump out, we wanted to be colorful and, and different. But we also chose that cartoony look a bit uh, because uh, technical limitations. We wanted this game to run on really old machines as well, even on, for instance, an Intel integrated graphics processor. We wanted to make our audience as big as possible. But for Original Sin 2, we gave our art director, like, come up with a couple of things that you want to do in an RPG that you want to see. So he came up with this very realistic looking uh, thing a couple of years ago. And we said like, okay, we have to upgrade our engine, like, completely. We sometimes have people or people in forums asking like, why is this game changed? And some people really like the first one style better or the second one style better. There's really like different opinions about anything. Uh, for me, the biggest reason why we changed it is that we were not really interested to make the same game over and over again at Larian. So we said like, okay, we did that and now we're going to do something completely different. And we also felt like we, the stories that writers come up with usually have this kind of grim tone sometimes and that, that sometimes conflicts with super cartoony stuff. So we felt like we wanted to make a more mature kind of game, so we pushed the graphics to a more mature kind of realistic design scope of things. We looked at our own surroundings to make interesting environments. So for the City of Arts, we actually looked at Ghent to have the architecture that's here, that's well known to us, but not really known in the world. So we really used the, the kind of Flemish 16th century architecture, which is like super uncommon in video games to have this kind of architecture in there, so I tried to push that in. We looked at castles in England and, and we visited a lot of places to catch a certain atmosphere that we don't see regular in all the regular RPG medieval stuff that comes from America. It looks really colorful and pleasant. Sometimes it doesn't because uh, we're going to dark places and uh, there's horrible things happening there. I did help concept out the world, yes. But um, my main focus was uh, characters, monsters. The most recognizable piece I did is the key art. It was a collaborative project, as always. 
We also used an outsourced uh, company to help us design it and give it a more AAA look. The process for it was uh, fairly classic, actually. We first uh, sketched out some uh, different propositions, some different um, compositions, different lighting. And then once this was made, we had to do a 3D scenes with the characters we had. And uh, after that, you, you tweak it a bit in Photoshop and you uh, build on top, uh, photo texture it, and strive to get the best result you can with it. What I enjoyed the most in uh, working uh, in original scene two, it was uh, uh, concepting the main characters, actually. And it was also uh, interaction with multiple uh, other guys from other departments, uh, animation, uh, character artists, stuff like that. I worked a lot on character creation and uh, I was the person who picked uh, outfits that you see in character creation, who picked faces, uh, also who did the uh, setup, the overall setup for uh, undeads. Like I was the first person to actually see them in character creation because I put them in there. <laughs> and uh, mostly the person who worked on armor progression, uh, polishing meshes and uh, making sure that uh, they look in the game how I want them to look in the game. I always want more from visuals, like it's it's not enough for me just to see the description of like an epic armor that I just found, like a legendary chest plate. I want to see it on my character. I like to iterate, uh, I like to think uh, broadly of um, not only just making an armor set or making a character, I want to make more things with limited resources, like that's challenge, but that's exciting. When you see the result, uh, it's it's really impressive. Actually, we also have like uh, the inside statistics of what players pick and uh, what do they found in the world and such. And when the game was released, I just went straight to Steam and I went to screenshots. I saw the players, how they like looked when they were level five and then how they looked at the end of the game and what faces did they pick, what hairstyles did they pick. And I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I did that. I worked on that. An amazing feeling uh, when, for example, you see uh, a Twitch streamer and then he comments on your art, he's like, oh yeah, and uh, here's a character creation, oh, I can equip a helmet here, wow! <laughs> I think I felt like a part of a great team and I'm really glad to actually contribute to the project that so many people liked. Uh, we wanted to achieve a couple of very important goals with the music production. The first goal was uh, we wanted to build a new dynamic music system which was supposed to be in a perfect harmony with the living world of Rivalon. Then, of course, we wanted to fill this music system with good music, which was meant to be inspired and driven by the narrative design. Our games are known for giving you the chance to make your own path in the universe, and I wanted the music to support your own story, your own adventures, to reflect the way you'd like to approach the game. Also, I wanted the music to be as varied, as colorful and quirky as possible because this way I wanted to stay connected and to keep the connection with the previous installment in the series. Kirill Pokrovsky is a legendary composer. We all loved him so much. His music, the way he was composing, was absolutely unique. You could instantly recognize his signature in his music. So it, for me it was quite a challenge because from one side I wanted to remain faithful to the previous installment in the series, as you can imagine, especially being a huge fan of the music. And on the other side, I wanted to, to make a step in the, in the future. We wanted to go brave and innovative, and that was uh, the reason we gave the chance to select your own origin instrument at the beginning of the game, which was going to take the lead in the soundtrack in battles and certain areas and moments. That was something very exciting. and. I haven't seen anywhere else previously. Might be wrong, but I haven't seen it. And it was very, very exciting for me to give the chance uh, to the players to select their own origin instrument. Another 
thing that um, we did with the music, which was interesting and very exciting for me, was I remember I was thinking and talking with uh, our director. How about instead of having one main theme, we have seven? What do you say? <laughs> well, we have these six origin characters. So I was thinking, how about if we create six origin main themes where every theme reflects the corresponding backstory and character. And then, of course, the last one, which was supposed to govern them all. This way I wanted to achieve as varied and as colorful score as possible. A score which reflects and supports your own story, your own adventures. But I'm happy to say that we succeeded. The game kept changing and evolving and um, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to be requested because I think Laren Games is filled with those tiny fun things, you know, like you can grow wings and horns and all of a sudden like uh, you never expected that to be a request, you know. I mean, I was sure that it's going to be a success because I saw the people working on it and I saw their passion and um, it's just amazing like uh, to see to see it come together and then to receive like such a good feedback My name is Bert uh, Bert van Semmert here in Dutch uh, I'm technical director at Larian Studios, so I'm the head of the programmers, so I'm responsible for the technology that we're writing together with the whole team, of course. This goes from the, the tools to build the levels, to allow artists to make models that you can see in the game, to allow them to, to add lighting and shadows to the game, and to have all kinds of materials that they can use that basically they can make the game and that it runs well on PCs and later then on consoles as well. Personally, I wanted to I want an RPG that would bring people back into like, um, the classic type of RPGs that we had like from the days of Baldur's Gate. Delivering a game that RPGers would appreciate, like going back to some type of nostalgia, you know? We all have those games. So redoing games in that genre, but better, <laughs> with as much RPG elements in it. Because many RPGs start off as an RPG, but they end up being something else if they're reiterated into, let's say, RPG 1, RPG 2, RPG 3, or like World of Warcraft expansions, for example. People no longer are willing to spend much time in RPGs. They want it to be instantly gratified instead of working for things. So I was hoping that we could deliver a story that um, kept people going, actually. We're really trying to make a hardcore RPG for niche gamers, but we try to also add things in there which uh, not hardcore players can also enjoy. The biggest challenge, I think, for us, the fact that the game is so systemic and that, it's so, that players have so much freedom, because it's hard to predict in what kind of situations players will arrive, basically. Because they can do crazy stuff. I mean, they can bring on 10 exploding barrels, they can put them on the battlefield, let them explode all at once. So it's not like a, a linear racing game, or then you can really predict, like, there's so many cars, they will see these kind of objects there and there. It's a huge challenge for the scripters because they have to implement all those possible choices that the players can make and all the possible fallbacks. I mean, when the narrative doc often says like, okay, there are a few guards here and the player has to get in, and then you have to start thinking, okay, in what ways could the player get in? They could kill the guards, they could bribe them, they could persuade them, maybe there's a back door by which they can circumvent the guards, but what if they then come out again of the house from the door and the, what should the guards do then and so on? And there's so many different uh, situations you have to think of, but that makes it also very challenging and very fun. It's very hard for QA to cover everything because there are so many options that you have. It's actually a, a crazy process, honestly. We have speed runs, we have checklists, you know, we have full runs, full walkthroughs, basically, that we're doing on a daily basis, non-stop. And we also have a basic functionality test, so there's tons of checklists that we have to check basically every day if people are able to complete the quests, what the difficulties were in there. But also because of the multiplayer, I mean, you can be with four players in one location, for example, doing all kinds of things. So there's all, all these things are hard to predict, so you need to program a bit defensively to, to, to try to cope with this. Let's say he throws a chair in the middle of a scripted event. Already this is something that we need to account for as QA because it can break scripts, it can break quests. And if we don't take into account what multiplayer people are doing, 
then you will have a very buggy game. Almost every build that will get created by the programmers, something else is, uh, doesn't work correctly or somebody that makes a, a different change in script uh, has an impact on another script in another level. So to cover those things, you have to do iteration upon iteration consistently. The way the scripting works is actually everything starts with the core story document, which is written by the writers and Sven. Then the narrative designer cuts that up into quests and situations, which are then handed out to individual scripters. The scripters then look at that narrative situation or that quest and create some gameplay around it, write up a quest design document. The gameplay lead goes over that quest design document and approves it and then the scripter starts implementing it. But the fun thing here at Larian, basically in every game, more or less every scripter gets one joker card, which they can use to have something weird of their own making to put in the game. We had a, I made a small level, which was technically under the ocean, and we wanted to create a trap there because it felt a bit empty, but we, we didn't really know what. So we had this weird contraption with pipes, and, and it, did, it just didn't make sense to have that on that location. So then Jonas came up with the idea to have like a, a boat smashed through the, the rock wall and then you would enter a combat with a shark that was stuck in the, in the ship. It's, it's a bit of a special event because it's not really tied to any quest. It was not, nowhere in the design docs originally and so on. It was just a dungeon which was a bit empty and I thought, oh, that would be nice. I, I remember that I thought this, no, this will not be approved for, for the release. But uh, yeah, it did, so... <laughs> Look out! I see a trap nearby. A combat is a puzzle that the player will solve using tools that they have themselves designed. The tools are your wizard, your warrior, your rogue. You created them yourself and you're looking for validation. So you want to test your strength and the cleverness of your own design, your characters. You want to see how this group of, of your tools will fare against this puzzle in particular. It is going to be evident that certain fights, certain puzzles are going to be easier to a group that has three warriors than to a group that has only clerics, for instance. So to test this myself, I have to make sure that it works all the time. I have something that we call the preset editor which lets me build a party of characters. I have a party with three rogues, two rangers, I have a party with just elemental guys. And I test all the fights through the different prisms of these party presets. And then I, I spot bugs. Every fight gets tested, depending on its importance, a fight can take one afternoon to make and get tested like 10 times. Or for like a final fight, a story beat or a climax of some sort can take up to two, three weeks and be tested, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 times. We can uh, be sure that the player will get to some point of uh, the game with the particular amount of hit points or weapons or skills because they can go whenever they want. And more than that, they can get any kind of weapons, any kind of crazy skills, any kind of everything. They could uh, have the weapons mass destruction with them that can one-shot most of the enemies. But that is not something that we are actively fighting. On the contrary, it's something that we think is one of the main features of the game. So basically, we give you tools and uh, you as a player come up with ways to use them as you see fit. Probably the most famous example of this abusing uh, the liberty that we give to the players would be Lava Surface. Uh, we have Lava in the game that instantly kills most of the characters. So basically, if you get enemies near lava, then you can one-shot a lot of guys, including the bosses. But then, there are actually way, rather than move the enemies, move the surface itself. So the players find a way to do that, and then they have like, a tremendous amount of fun just uh, going with this lava in tow uh, through all the lands, one-shotting everybody, and yeah, this, this is really cool. Combat is really, it's, it's a bit like uh, an argument or a conversation. You want it to move fast and you want both sides to have answers and responses. 
In those one, sometimes it felt like either players had too much time to speak their mind and, and AI was not really responding, or sometimes AI would, would just unleash hell on, on players. So in those two, our, our big aim was to kind of make it a bit more dynamic, and make, uh, make sure that uh, monsters can surprise you and make sure that you always had something to answer. Even if it looked like you were having a losing battle, you would come up with something cool as a solution. To do this, uh, we changed the action economy. We gave you a bit fewer actions to keep the pace of combat up. And we also reworked uh, some of the numbers in, in the game to make sure that at any level of play we, we had ways to both challenge you and also give you a, a, a fun, simple encounter just to kind of give you some rest after like completely beating you. At the beginning in DOS 1, the game was a bit hardcore in terms of nothing was really explained to you. You would just go, okay, you switch to turn-based logic, turn-based system, and well, pick up that sword and fight. It was a bit difficult for uh, people to get into that because you would get wrecked, uh, essentially. Uh, <laughs> for DOS 2, we really needed, and we really I, I, we tried, to rearrange combat following learning workshops, what skills you would get, how to use them. For instance, we would teach you about surfaces one fight at a time, we would teach you about explosive barrels, this and that. We would try to essentially flatten the learning curve or make it you know, easier on the player. We would create a progression to not submerge the players with new elements that would kill that player without giving them time to understand what the hell just happened. RPGs don't allow you much nowadays, you know, like even classics like the Final Fantasy series, which I think are fantastic, they do not allow the player to express and do it their way. You are led through a linear experience, which is a great experience, but it's still pretty linear. So it was important for Sven because he comes from a time where Ultima and Ultima 7, Ultima Online was very popular and all these games had the same thing in common which was being able to express yourself in completing the quest. So we had to offer those things and I think it's an important aspect for an RPG that the player has choice in how he approaches certain things because if you cannot experience freedom to a player, how can one experience the role playing? You have to get it right and every single detail matters. So everything must be connected to the lore, everything must be connected to uh, the story. It must be legible in terms of shapes and colors, and, uh, and it has to make sense with the world. You cannot, for instance, meet something that does not make sense uh, somewhere because that would damage immersion, and that's an RPG. Immersion is critical, so it's really important that as I design these sort of like logic puzzles, I keep in mind the scenario aspect of things. Basically, the world is your toy box. And when you see a situation, it's not something that has fixed solution. It's not something that we as the designers install the hoops for players to jump in. This is just a situation that you can solve in any way you see fit. It actually makes me very glad when people find a very crazy, very interesting way to exploit, to use and to abuse some of the mechanics you put in there. Everybody is glad, everybody has fun, uh, because when you do that, you find a really cool solution that nobody ever found. That's, that's really where the fun comes from. The Larian is super self-critical, but I consider it a quality. Sometimes it's super frustrating, yeah, because if you're in the, in the position that gets criticized, it's not fun to have it, but it, it, I think that most people accept it and it helps us forward. Because it's better that you look at your errors and you tell them, and as you say, this is wrong, rather than you have a million players telling you that something is wrong, because by then it's typically too late. After all this time, what I've learned from working on Original Sin 2, probably to be patient. <laughs> patience is a virtue. Uh, and to have communications consistently with people, because if there's no communication, then the project falls apart. And I've learned to uh, accept things as they are sometimes, where I see an improvement, someone else may not see an improvement about a concept, which we may want or may want not in the game. And I've learned more to accept uh, the reality that we have to compromise sometimes and that we need to um, be able to cut where necessary. Sometimes roles in studios are very segmented, but here, basically, if you have a good idea and, and you believe in it hard enough, you can convince the right people, uh, you can put anything in the game, and, and that is kind of crazy, really. <laughs> and and that's, that, that kind of creative expression and the kind of power is, is very rare, I think. The nicest things that I remember you from the development is actually the the finishing of the, the games always because that's it's kind of a crunch period. 
It's long days and it's hard work and it's stressful, but in the end, it's really nice to see a team coming together and to get something finished. So there's always that moment where, where you learn exactly what the release date is gonna be. Okay, it's set. This is the day, the game has to be done. There it is. And everybody panics and everybody's like, okay, we just gotta get this done. One great thing about being at Larian is that crunch is not really a way of life. That's not really the way we do things. Uh, that said, there, there does come a time when you just have to like sort of pour as much time as you can into it. And so there were a couple months in 2017 where we definitely poured as much as we could into it to make the game the best it can possibly be. All the writers came over to the Ghent office and uh, we all worked together in a room for you know a long time in a hot summer and uh, I don't know it was very stressful and very intense but it was also a lot of fun. The, the atmosphere um, was actually was actually great trying to finish up all the origin stories all the, the quests and, and working on it uh, through the day and through the night almost not literally but you know and sitting together here, having fast food every day, <laughs> delivered to the office, uh, maybe have a beer later in the evening. Yeah, it, it creates a bond, you know. There was a lot of pressure, sure, but you could tell that everybody who was here wasn't here just because they had to. You know, they worked on it with a lot of passion. And I think you feel that, and that translates into the game. The writing schedule is a little bit different sometimes. Our crunch happens earlier and the reason for that is because eventually you have to lock in the dialogue so everything can be voice recorded and voice recording is another whole can of worms that uh, luckily I don't deal a lot with but uh, it still has to be done so we were here with our late nights and then there comes a time when it's sort of done and then our tasks go to different things like there's the issue with having several Americans working on a game where we're using British English Americans like me aren't necessarily used to all of the, you know, using the right words and the right spellings and things like that. So it came down to, for example, going through and making sure that uh, color was spelled right and that everything had the right U. There was also little stuff like uh, the undead. I can't say they were a late addition, but they were later than I think many people might have realized. And what adding the undead sort of threw a wrench into the writer's works because when we're writing, and you don't even know this when you're writing something, when you're writing, you're making a lot of references to body parts and, and somebody flushes and, or somebody's, you know, their lips touch or whatever. And suddenly you have an undead and shit tons of lines stop making sense because you're dealing with an undead that doesn't have any lips and suddenly can't refer to like tattoos on their skin or whatever. And so that became a big thing in and of itself um, was chasing down all of the uh, lines that stopped making sense if an undead spoke them. And I know I didn't find them all, but I tried really hard. There, there are still a few places where I think, though, that you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. I'm an undead. What do you mean my skin is flushing? I know it's 18 hours of my life because I was like really keeping track of how much I was crunching. <laughs> the finale to Loza's story, like she sort of sings at the end and uh, there was an animation, there was music for it, but it looks kind of bland just to have a character dancing there, so I made a bunch of effects for it. And it was like, okay, I worked on this for an entire day, that was 10 hours. And then the next day, oh, I've done the exact amount of hours I need to do today and it's finished. <laughs> It was really nice to see it all come together and people were really responding positively to how it was coming out. It was the amazing summer. So it was release day. Everything was kind of okay and ready, of course, because you, the game has to be ready before release. But there were still some like uh, loose ends that we had to tie up on uh, like on a Steam page or, or getting a certain file uh, in order so everything looks nice. And on that day, on release day, like the power went out in the building and in the entire section of Ghent, actually, a quarter of Ghent was without power. And so we couldn't upload anything because most of the stuff was here in Ghent. Uh, we do have some backups in the other studios, but like the files we needed were here. So we ended up taking a bunch of computers here and, and heading over to Farang's apartment here in Ghent because that was in the side that still had uh, power. And it was actually pretty close to get everything in order by uh, 5 p.m because that was when the release was happening on Steam and then it was a, it was a pretty like, 
surreal moment to like press the button and have everything ready at like 4.45 or something and 15 minutes later uh, we were watching the TV uh, behind us and Carnage was streaming the game on Twitch. So that was like close call that day. So it's these kind of stress situations which are very stressful at the moment but are really, these are good moments if you look back on them afterwards. It's a bit of a mixed feeling there because of the long days but it's very nice to, to see something if it's, if it's successful, yeah, then it's even better. There was a lot of energy, and so and that energy culminated in something beautiful. I mean, something that people that aren't in the games industry don't realize is what uh, 15,000 bucks in Jura does to a person. Because the only thing that you see in those last months of development is just error, 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 bug, 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 bug. Now, if somebody tells you 15,000 times how bad you are or what's broken, it's not very good for your self-image, right? It's often important at that moment to remind yourself, actually, no, I mean, like, we have these 15,000 bucks, but it's still cool. That's a fight that you, as a developer, have to go through every single time. But it felt really good when we succeeded with it. Uh, but it was really, really complicated. I remember a week before the release, there was a data log, so we couldn't uh, keep working and improving the game. It was like, okay, so right now we just like keep quiet and uh, <laughs> uh, bear through the release. So basically, we were asked to uh, divide into teams and uh, play with each other between the employees. It, it was just so amazing, you know, just to play together, to see what we did, to explore some quests and like, it was really fun, you know, to enjoy the game, the product that we made with the people that I worked closely with. What makes a, a, a game like Original Sin unique is the amount of people that have given an, an feedback into this. It's not just the, the ideas and thoughts of a single person, but it's an amalgamation of uh, feedback and ideas within the company. Everybody gets listened to. Everybody has a voice here. So all the feedback gets taken up and we go we reiterated with design. Now it's Sven himself. So that's why we have like this personal flavor to the game, I think. It's not a rigid structure here. It's more like an organic uh, structure that we have in the company. I always wanted to, to work in RPGs, make an RPG, work in, in uh, you know, this, this medieval fantasy, the Met fan uh, you know, uh, area. And one day I remember sitting here like five years ago or something, coding like a troll for an infiltration sequence a la Metal Gear. And I remember pausing the Skyrim soundtrack that I just loop <laughs> in my headset and I thought, it's happening, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm like, you know, making a med, med fan RPGs. This is awesome, this is the best. And I think that feeling never quite left me. Like even though at some point we crunch, even though we work really hard, I still have from time to time that moment of, shit, this is awesome. I think everybody that I've spoken to who works Valarian seems very absorbed in this universe that they've created and there's this real sense of fun and absolutely loving this world. Everybody's just in love with this place they've created and a lot of them feel very deeply for the characters that they connect with. I truly believe that if you want the people to enjoy the games you, are, you develop, you should enjoy the process of, uh, of creation, the process of developing these games. It's so obvious when you're playing a game, you can say whenever the developers had fun, because all the passion, all the emotions are being reflected in the, in the game itself. It's a privilege and honor for me to be part of the Larian family. And a great pleasure, of course, because before joining Larian, I was playing every single Divinity game. Now, I'm one of the guys who developed the games. There's this weird thing that happens when you go from being a critic to being a game maker, which is when you're a critic, you get to see the whole of the thing right there and you're developing opinions about both the whole and the parts. When you're working on it, you see all of the parts and nothing but the parts. And obviously we're playing our own game all the time, but we're typically not playing a big chunk of it. I'm not playing all of Original Sin 2 every day. And therefore, you're seeing all the things that could have gone differently. You're seeing all the things that maybe weren't as good as they could have been. You're seeing all the possibilities that never came to fruition, all the ideas that you had that you couldn't fit in. And I just didn't have a real sense of how good it was. I felt good about my work in it. 
um, and about everybody's work in it. But as, as in terms of like a whole experience, I just didn't have real any anything to hold on to going into the game's release, and so it was really more of a relief than anything that it that it did so well critically and that it sold so well. I really do not think about it that much. I honestly really enjoy that people are enjoying the game, but all the accolades that come with it, you know, that's, that's fine. The only thing I, I really think about is looking at what we did, identifying what was good, identifying what was not good, and trying to do it better next time. Know that you can still do better, and that you can still be more innovative, and that you still have all kinds of stuff that you haven't tried out yet, but that you can do to, to, to ameliorate the, the final product. We should never say product, it's a horrible term, the final game. <laughs> Just taking that aboard and still, you know, wanting to do a lot of things better now. I can definitely say that as we push ahead into uh, new projects, we're going to do some, some pretty cool stuff, I think. Yeah. Come to me, the night is dark. Come to me, the night is long. Sing for me, I'll sing along. Sing for me, oh, sing for me. Come to me, the night is dark. Come to me, the night is long. Sing for me, I'll sing along. Sing for me. Sing for me Swear with me, we'll make them scream Dance with me, we'll make them bleed Sing for me, I'll sing along Sing for me, oh sing for me